Welcome to the Memories of a Moonbird podcast, exploring life one story at a time. Hello, friends, and welcome to season two of the Memories of a Moonbird podcast. I'm still Daniel Sherl. We have an amazing season planned for you with more stories, travel tips, and of course, interviews with some really incredible and inspiring people. So tell your friends and family to subscribe and thank them for me in advance. We're going to kick off 2020 right now with an interview with someone who's pretty darn outstanding. The truth is, you wouldn't know it if he were walking down the street right next to you. But he's been entertaining you and scaring the pants off of you for more than 20 years. Almost always completely hidden underneath incredible prosthetics and costumes created by Academy Award winning artists. He's been the creatures, creepies, demons, aliens, and bad guys that you've loved in movies and TV shows like American Horror Story, Star Trek, Grimm, Men in Black, Z Nation, Sleepy Hollow, and Teen Wolf. Today, he's not only currently the big bad guys on CBS's new show, Evil, but he's also going to be appearing in the upcoming and highly anticipated Star Trek Picard. In addition to his fascinating career as a creature suit performer, he's not only traveled all around the world, but he's a phenomenal photographer and videographer who I've had the distinct pleasure of working with many, many times. He's passionate about the environment and sustainability, and that's something we're going to chat a bit about. He's also going to tell us what it's like to be beneath all of that goop and foam and silicone as the proverbial man behind the mask. And he may even throw in a few travel tips for fun. Please welcome phoning in from set in New York City, Mr. Marty Matulis. Marty, welcome to 2020 and the show. Hey, Daniel. Thanks. Nice to be here. And thanks for phoning in from set. Yes, indeed. No worries. Technology makes everything possible. It's an incredible world we live in. So let's jump right in. Where are you from? Where am I from? Well, I guess technically I'm a California native, though I spent my formative years in the Black Hills in South Dakota from uh, second grade through ninth grade. The rest of it's been kind of in and around California. What was that like growing up in South Dakota? It was great. Uh, at the time, you know, being that young and going to such a drastically different part of the country, it was a little culture shocky. But looking back on it, it was one of the most amazing experiences I could have had. It kind of informed my sensibilities in a lot of areas. That's very cool. And did you travel a lot when you were growing up with your family? There were a lot of road trips. Um, we traveled from back and forth from California to Missouri, where I had grandparents, South Dakota when we moved there, in and around South Dakota. Not a lot of plane travel, mostly car trips. So did taking all these road trips as a kid inform your desire to travel as an adult, do you think? I think so. It was as a kid, it was probably equal parts uh, interest in what was happening on the trip and a desire to get out of the car and away from my parents. So <laughs> both were kind of pushing me to go explore on my own. So, yeah, whenever we'd arrive at, at a place like, you know, say Devil's Tower, I would immediately get out of the car, go play in the dirt, go run off and kind of try to get lost a little bit. Now, do you still play in the dirt as an adult? As often as I possibly can. <laughs> yes. I'm definitely a hippie at heart. I love, you know, being in nature and scrounging for mushrooms and looking at trees. I've, I've even hugged one. Uh, what do you, uh, what, what do you like most about traveling? I think breaking out of the comfort of the daily routine, you know, anywhere you go, there's going to be something interesting to see and people to talk to. But the biggest benefit I've ever had is just not doing the exact same thing. We get very kind of complacent and comfortable, like getting up, making your yeah. coffee, going to work. But when you travel, it throws a lot of that out of the window. Breaks up the routine and Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. you've got to you've got to flex some new muscles and and use your brain or your iPhone brain. <laughs> the there's eye brain. Of, there's a lot of new things to figure out once you hit the ground in a new place. What's been something that you have found over the years to be truly rewarding for your for yourself about travel? He is deep in thought. <laughs> <laughs> Don't edit that out. Just let it ride. <laughs> the most rewarding thing I think is just on the heels of the previous response, getting out of the routine. But having conversations with people who have had a very different life than I've had. You go to a beer garden in Berlin and you're going to talk to 20 people who all are from different areas of the world and they all have interesting stories and they're not all about the exact same thing that you'll hear when you're at your local coffee shop in your local hometown. Sure, yeah. And just the, you know the overall benefit as a human of, of experiencing different cultures. That's one of my favorite things about travel actually is the breadth of, of human experience out there to explore and, and to talk to all these other fascinating human beings and realize you're just one small part of this greater, you know, cosmic thing, this living organism of billions of people on this, on this beautiful blue rock, you know? Yeah. And, and those experiences are not always sunshine and roses. There's assholes on every corner of the planet. Sure. 
Yeah. But that's that adds to the overall enjoyment of it is is seeing the variety of people out there. You know, one Can we of the say assholes on your podcast as many times as you want. It's already tagged asshole, as explicit. Asshole, 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 <laughs> asshole. One of the things that I, I think is so cool about meeting all these different people, and I and I like to tell people about this, is that when you have these experiences, right, you tend to understand more and more about humanity. And so therefore, what's cool about it is I think it hones your radar quite a bit. So traveling more gives you such a a greater insight into humanity that when you then meet other people in your hometown or in your city or whatever, you can pretty quickly assess kind of who they are, what they're about, and, and be able to decide you know, I think I might want to talk to this person and have them in my life and get to know them or make a new friend or whatever. And you can also, you know, conversely go, I'm definitely getting the fuck away from that guy because he's trouble and I can tell a mile away. Oh, nothing can beat the people pleaser right out of you than your first international trip. The first time I went out of the country was to Hong Kong and I was all smiles and, you know, good shiny vibes. And I found that there are a significant portion of the population around the tourist destinations that prey on that. They're looking for easy marks. They're looking to come up to a friendly face and take advantage of it. So it it didn't make me bitter or guarded per se, but it certainly does, as you said, kind of hones your radar and you kind of assess your situation with a little... Uh, a little better yeah, eyes. your skills as a human become it's like it's like you're leveling up in the video game of life it's how i i kind of like to make that analogy yeah yeah and travel is so many side missions in that video game of life <laughs> that's such a great video games are the best analogy <laughs> let's keep using that let's fit it in as often as we can so marty how did you first actually get into travel as an adult well i'd taken a couple of trips in high school that kind of started the whole desire to do more of it but finances were an issue as I was starting in the, the job world. And uh, a friend of mine talked about courier travel. And I thought, you, you're a drug mule. I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> but he told me about this amazing opportunity to go to Japan for a couple of weeks. And the ticket was 100 bucks, And I couldn't figure it out. So I researched it. And at the time, this is all pre-9-11, there were companies that found it much more affordable to ship their whatever computer parts, documents, in the uh, luggage allotment of a standard airplane ticket than to ship it as cargo. Hmm. So this was a pretty thriving thing back in the day where you could sign up for this courier monitoring website, kind of look at the destinations and then see what was available. A lot of times these last minute flights would pop up a hundred bucks round trip. Sometimes they were free. So literally I signed up one day. The next day I found a flight to Hong Kong leaving the next day and it was a hundred dollar round trip. Wow. So I, I was at work when I was doing this. I called my boss. I was like, hey, boss, what do you think about me being gone for two weeks starting tomorrow? And he said, where are you going? I said, Hong Kong. And he said, okay. So I ran home and packed a backpack that, full of all the wrong stuff. That was a cool stuff. boss. Yeah, he was fantastic. It was a great opportunity. So I packed a bunch of the wrong stuff into the wrong backpack, put on the wrong clothes, hopped on a plane, and had an amazing, <laughs> amazing experience in a culture that was so incredibly different than my own at the time that it just kind of cemented this, this both, both fear and love of travel, because I think it should be kind of a healthy mix of both, right? You want to have an adventure. Absolutely. You shouldn't know everything ahead of time. And Hong Kong was certainly different enough that it, it defied my expectations and just showed me that taking things as they come and, and not having too many expectations was really a, a key aspect to satisfying travel. That's amazing. Now, do they still do this kind of service in modern day? Uh, Not to the extent that they did. I don't know if it's still a thing or not, but with the the prevalence of internet travel resources, I think now it's just easier to, as you as you promote on your site, just find better ways to travel for cheaper. And there's always deals to be had. And I always recommend people sign up for every single uh, airline services, last minute deals, emails, because you'll whether it's you know skyscanner or expedia or whoever your jam is but it's so great to be able to get these emails that say hey if you can leave in a couple days we suddenly have last minute tickets to wherever for 49 dollars. you can end up going to cool places for very very cheap yeah and and as you get better and better at packing less and less you can just know what you're going to take grab your list throw things in your bag if it's not already packed and then hit the airport yeah i mean i'll be honest with you with the years i've been traveling i can literally pack a bag and be out the door for the airport in an hour. Amen, brother. 
let's talk about your career a bit because it's really cool. You you have an amazingly cool job, Marty. I really do. It's it's the best job a grown up five year old can have. Yeah, exactly. Like you you basically get to be a kid and explore all these fun things. You you in my opinion, you live in an almost permanent state of make believe. Yeah. Well, as you said in the intro, you know, I, I get to sit in an artist's chair and have them express their art all over my face. <laughs> that sounds really dirty. They don't, what do they do? <laughs> they apply their craft to my face. <laughs> they don't just make, bad. <laughs> God damn. They just, they just make a mess all over my face. <laughs> and then anyway, <laughs> after these talented Academy Award winning people have crafted whatever they craft, I get to go after they have put their goo on to, your cheeks. <laughs> it is. It's very <laughs> gooey. This took a turn. I wasn't expecting Daniel. <laughs> what is the adult rating on this? NA? Well, it's explicit. So we can talk about whatever we can talk about as much goo as we want. Okay. Good. <laughs> no, no. Let's, let's bring it back to some real serious talk. You do um, work with Academy Award winning makeup artists who, yeah, I mean the, the level at which these people work, they are, they are unbelievable, you know, uh, they have they have unbelievable craftsmanship, you know, and you get to For sit sure. there and experience this. Well, but what's it like to be in the chair? Because a lot of people don't know how it is to actually, can you walk them through the process of, of that? Yeah, well, the particular process starts well before the production when you have a cast made of your head or your hands or whatever parts they need to sculpt their alien slash creature slash whatever on. Uh, so you'll go in for a session there that involves sitting and having goop put all over you. Uh, to get the head cast. And this is like a then, gel so that the stuff doesn't stay permanently on your face, yeah, right? Yeah, it used to be kind of like a weird alginate material, and then they do plaster bandages over that. And nowadays, it's a like a two-part silicone that goes on quicker and is a lighter material and provides them a lot more detail. So then they'll make a positive of that that they can sculpt their creation on, and then they'll make the, the molds and the parts from that. So then when you get to the production, you sit in the chair. I typically shave my head and my face, so they can just start gluing right on. And then for the next couple of hours, I just sit in a chair looking into a mirror as I watch these ridiculously talented people build this creation on top of me. As a younger actor, I thought, oh, that, that's really cool, but it's more of a step to do something else. And now as a, what am I, nearly 50-year-old kid, <laughs> I adore this process. I've always loved it. And just to watch these people at such a high caliber do this art that then I can sit there and and kind of figure out how the creature is supposed to move. So as and you're then, having this this creature built on top of you and you're watching in the mirror as you're transforming into whatever, an alien or a demon or whatever, do you feel yourself in the chair as an actor start to transform into that character and have more ideas of what you're going to do? For sure. I try to come in with as many ideas as possible up front, seeing the designs, but then as it's being put on, the materials might have different thicknesses, so they might be harder to move. So if, if Marty, the actor, thinks that he can make a certain expression and I, tr I practice that expression in the, in the mirror, it might be different with the creature. I might have to put 30% more effort into my angry face or whatever happens at, during the scene. So that's my time to kind of figure out how mm. I can translate myself through the makeup and make the makeup look alive and not like a rubber mask. What has been the most challenging character you've ever had to have applied? Most of the characters have their own challenges, but I think there were a couple on Sleepy Hollow, one that have it had basically... Um, no mouth and no eyes. So I wasn't able to really eat for the entire time I was in the makeup. Um, I tried not drinking, but that didn't work so well after about six hours. So anytime you're, you're impeded in some way of sight or sound or taste or touch or whatever, that, that makes things a little more challenging. Obviously what you do has a level of thrill and excitement and there's, there's so much just coolness to the whole thing, you know, but there's also, I don't know if everyone realizes there, there are tough times as well. Uh, I've known you for a long time and I've, I've heard stories from set. There's been a couple injuries. There's times where, you know, it's freezing cold or whatever. What's it like? What's the reality of, of some of the harder parts of doing what you do? Well, the, the creature suit thing is definitely prone towards those extremes. I'm not a stunt man. I'm not going to do stunts, but it is expected that I can bring a physicality to the creatures. So that would involve whatever I can do. Crawl around on the ground, crawl through the muck, have a sword fight. So there are environmental extremes you have to deal with. There's, you know, smoke and other 
toxic things on set and the makeup itself can be kind of challenging. Would you say that being a creature suit performer uh, is is not for everybody, that it takes a specific kind of body type or person in general That's to do? absolutely true. The makeup artists themselves are looking for certain body types, certain physicalities. So they want someone, say, like my type is tall, slim, strong, that can wear the makeup, not be encumbered by it but also be thin enough that they can build up their creature without making it look overbuilt. Or they want someone just huge and strong to wear these 200 pound monster suits or someone very like tiny and flexible. Yeah, so they're definitely looking for specifics that will help them bring the creature to life. And how long is the process from the moment they call you and go, Marty, we have a new you know creature on Star Trek and we want you to come in and play whatever, a Romulan, uh, from the moment they cast you and then they have to call you back again after the cast is done being built, uh, and, then, and then the moment that you're in the chair, how long is that whole process usually? Well, with this kind of, of acting, this creature suit performance, typically now since I know so many of these people and there are so many copies of my head around and people have some working experience with me, I'll typically get an email or a text from one of these guys and they'll say, you know, hey, Marty, I've got this character and it's going to shoot such and such. So there's like the initial contact. And then uh, there might be a head casting or body part casting so they can start doing a sculpt. And then there's some back and forth with agent and casting at that point to make sure I'm the right fit. And then a couple months later, probably go to the initial meeting on set to do camera tests, movement tests, uh, makeup tests with the with the elements of the creature suit that are built at that time. So yeah, I think with Evil, it was about three months between that initial text and the pilot, which is pr- still pretty fast. What's your favorite part of that whole process? Uh, all of it. <laughs> 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 That's a tricky question because it each individual part of this is kind of... Uh, I don't even know how to say it. It's not a negative, but like, you know, it's hot. It's sweaty. You've got stuff glued onto your face with surgical adhesive that might be uncomfortable or might be bending your nose the wrong way. And, you know, you might be in a a suit that's like poking you in the wrong direction. And then you have to like sit there at the end of the day for another two hours after everybody's gone home to have it removed with like rubbing alcohol. It's horrible. But all in all, it's just the best thing ever. Those are the questions I want to ask you is how long is the removal process for something like, let's say, a Romulan in Star Trek? Removal processes are... I say the kind of an average of a half to a third as long as the application process. If it's a lengthy application, obviously there's a lot more stuff to take off. But we also try to ride the line between how long the shoot day is and how much glue do we really need to put on my face. So it's typically about an hour and a half, I would say, to get everything taken off. You've had the good fortune to work with some of the coolest actors in the industry. Has there been a particular starstruck moment when you're like, ooh, my little boy is freaking out because I'm with this cool person. I get to do a scene with them. Well, I would like to say that I'm just so cool as a cucumber that that would never happen. But (laughs) a couple times uh, on Sleepy Hollow, I had an opportunity to work over several days in a couple scenes with uh, John Noble. Mm, Denethor. Uh, He was so cool. And he's got the most gravelly, syrupy voice. It was awesome. I, it was hard for my character, who was kind of this devil character, to really berate him and slap him down because I felt just so in awe of him and the other characters I'd seen him play. But, you know, I rallied to the cause and gave him what for. You gave him a good ass whooping. You betcha. <laughs> uh, and the other one I got to say is uh, Patrick Stewart. Um, one of the first gigs I ever did just as a young pup in Hollywood doing the uh, some background stuff to kind of learn my way around a set. I was on Star Trek Insurrection and uh, we were up on a hill, up on a mountainside outside of Bishop, California, and everyone was just kind of sitting around and, you know, I didn't want to, we were, we were told, and I, of course, I didn't want to bother any of the principal actors, but when you're six feet away from Patrick Stewart and he's just sitting there looking at a rock, you do what you got to do. So I I asked him about something that I saw them do uh, where they were, he and um, Gates McFadden were closing their eyes before a take and kind of gazing off toward the sun. I'm like, what What are they doing? Are they trying to get a quick suntan? Are they evening out their color? What is that? So I said, you know, excuse me, Mr. Stewart, what, what? And he, he very kindly said, oh, well, what you do is you close your eyes and then when you look back at the camera, you don't blink. And to date, that's the best piece of acting advice I'd, I've ever had. That's really cool. What, and what great advice to other actors out there? Yeah. What, what's the what's the what's the uh, Stuart technique? So the process basically is uh, 
So you don't squint and blink when the camera's on you if the if the location is kind of sunny. You uh, close your eyes, stare toward the sun for about 30 seconds, and then when you look back to the camera, open your eyes, you're far less prone to the squinty, blinky thing that looks so bad on the camera. Thank that you, Patrick Stewart. Awesome. Thank you, Sir Patrick. That's great. And thank you, Sir Marty. Indeed. Uh, we can all aspire to sir Dum. I actually think it would be a dream come true to be knighted. I think that would be like one of those things you go, I have achieved greatness now. I, I, am, I am Sir Daniel. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. And for nothing that actually is deserving of it, just to have it. <laughs> well, I'd like to do something that, you know, like maybe my podcast influences the world in a positive way and I'm recognized for wanting to do, you know, to move the world forward in a good way. That would be cool. You know, or writing a one of my novels gets, you know, successfully known and and then demand that everyone around you call you sir daniel i wouldn't demand that Um, i would i would would have a shirt that says please address me as sir martin (laughs) well sir martin i have a question for you yes sir daniel uh what's one of your favorite places you've traveled in the world i think one of my favorite places was prague Mm. and i think it was one of my favorites because of the amount of time that i actually spent there prior to going there a lot of my travel was as most people do, they'll figure out how much time they have and they'll try to pack as much as they can into the time. Yeah. For this trip, I knew that I had a certain amount of time and I made a conscious choice to only go to Prague. We had a couple of other destinations, but they were on the outside of this other trip to Prague. So for Prague, I think we spent a week or maybe 11 days. And that was the, one of the best travel choices I ever made. Uh, it allowed me to relax. It allowed me to get familiar with my coffee shop and the place I'd go to breakfast and how to go here and there for internet. That made it much, a much richer travel experience to, to just be able to kind of take in more of the actual city and get a flavor for it and kind of understand its history while you're, while you're in the city itself. Well, this is something I'm very passionate about trying to teach people is that if you want to do what I call the movie preview trip, where you just go to 10 countries in five days and you're always constantly on the move, You can do that, but in my opinion, it's a waste of time and money because you're never going to be immersed in any real culture. You're not going to be able to talk to the people. You're not going to be able to get to know the place. You're just going to see the highlight reel and, oh, I saw the three famous things uh, every tourist sees. And that's not really what traveling should be about. And I agree with you. I think being able to go and immerse yourself in a culture is, is so important. When we were in Scotland, for instance, you know, we got to spend two weeks just being there, we, we ended up talking to a lot of locals. We got referrals to great places to go explore. It was such a richer experience. And, you know, I look back on it with great fondness. I would go to Scotland anytime anyone ever invited me. You know? Agreed. Yeah. And it, I think it does. It largely comes down to the people you can be around as well. I think that finding a coffee shop, grabbing a map, and striking up a conversation is probably the best thing you can do when you get to any new destination. And is that how you, is that how you get familiar with a new place? Yeah. I mean, I don't much care for cities other than what they can offer culturally or uh, gastronomically. Um, I like to get out into nature. But prior to that, I do like to kind of take stock of the the land and and see what there is available in the city. So I do want to go to a coffee shop. I do want to sit down, relax a bit, grab a map. I love a physical, physical map. I'll grab a piece of paper map any day of the week. That also makes other people interested in what you're doing because that might be their local coffee shop and they might want to come over and see what you're up to. But being able to sit down with someone and and talk about their interests in their city is far better than what you can grab out of somebody else's guidebook that you're reading. True. Absolutely true. But then escaping that kind of central tourist area that you inevitably arrive in in a new city, uh, I like to strike out and find things in this area that are similar to interests that I have. So I'm interested in photography. I'm interested in woodworking. If I can go to a new city in a new country and find out from someone who in that area is a great woodworker, then I might try to contact them and go see what they're doing and sit in their shop and take photography. It it seats you into that particular culture in a way that you're not going to do if you just hit the highlights in your guidebook. Yeah, I mean, Jolene actually talks a lot about this with friends when she's telling them, she's like, look, you know, she's really into animals and nature and stuff, right? So she always tries to find unique animal experiences wherever we go. 
we did nurtured by nature with the small uh, the the small clawed Asian otters and the water uh, puppies. I saw that yeah, video. Oh man, there's there was so great. And then you know wherever we go, whatever country we go to, we always try to find unique animal experiences. Oh, I get to see this animal that I've never seen before in person. You know, those those are the things that make trips truly epic and worthwhile. Absolutely, I agree 100. percent I think that that's something that when you're when you're young, in addition to over traveling, you know, packing too much into your schedule. <clears throat> You do want to hit the highlights. You know, you do want to go to the Louvre. If you're in Paris, you want to hit the pyramids when you're in Egypt. But as you get older, I think it it becomes a lot easier to see the benefit in in doing something specific to the culture that isn't a top tourist thing. You're never, you're never going to get a sense of a, an accurate sense of the culture if you're just going down the, the tourist list. Yeah. If you're just checking off the things that everyone else has done before you, there there will be a level of, I think, boredom to the trip that you will innately feel at some point. Yeah. And that's tourism. That's not travel. That's tourism. Big difference. That is brilliantly said, sir. Well, thank you. I'm going to have to quote brilliant. you on that in a future post. Quote away, my friend. Getting back to your career for a second, travel is generally, as my friend John said, travel is baked into an actor's life. Uh, I assume you've traveled quite extensively for your career? I'd say it's been pretty significant all in all. When I was starting out, it was largely based around Los Angeles. Um, one of the first jobs I did, went. it took me to Berlin. And uh, it was for a little movie called The Apparition. Oh, yeah. I played yeah. The Apparition, but uh, he's barely there. So don't blink or you'll miss The Apparition in The Apparition. <laughs> but going to Berlin, we were shooting at the Babelsberg Studios on the same stage where they shot Metropolis. And, and there's so much history infused in that as a cinema lover that I was just on cloud nine. Mm. The job itself was almost secondary to that experience and, and the people that I met doing it. Do you think that was the most fun or interesting place that you've traveled for your career? To date for the career, yeah, I think that was probably a highlight. Um, when I was on Sleepy Hollow, there were regular trips to Wilmington, North Carolina, where they were shooting. So I got to know that area and developed a love for seafood in Wilmington, North Carolina that I didn't have prior. Uh, and then currently Evil shoots in in Brooklyn, and I love me some New York City, so it's always lovely to go there. But then I have the good fortune of being able to come back to Portland, Oregon, where I base nowadays, and live in the forest and play with my dog and go hiking and and uh, explore the, the nature lover side of life as well. Well, so let's talk about your, your love of nature and the environment and sustainability and whatnot that was mentioned in the intro. You're you're very, very environmentally conscious uh, you're, you're also someone who's very pro trying to educate through, uh, I'm, I'm going to summarize you and say by leading by example and you post stuff on Facebook and you try to, you know, educate friends when you're having conversations, Hey, you know, if you just switch over to that, you know, sustainable straw, you don't have to keep those throwing away those plastic ones or whatever it is, you know, uh, and you've, you've certainly educated me on several things that are great to help the environment. What drives your passion to do that? And then I have some other questions, but first let's let's talk about kind of how you got into all of it. I think that what made you what made you what <clears throat> made you a tree hugger? <laughs> <laughs> what made me the tree hugger that I am today? Uh, I think growing up in the Black Hills was a big part of it. I was surrounded by nature. I went out and played in the forest by myself, and then moving to a city after that and seeing the stark contrast made me appreciate nature in a way that someone who just grows up in a city probably doesn't get. Um, but then also seeing the impact that we have as a species, as you get older, it becomes more apparent and wherever you fall on global warming and or its causes, there's no denying that the billions of us on this planet burning our little cars, fossil fuel engines, of course we have an impact. So it's difficult to decide how much you want to devote your life to minimizing your own impact. Um, I try it in as many ways as I can. I don't like single-use disposable anythings. I try to be aware of uh, packaging. You know, if you're buying something, shop in the bulk section in grocery store. It can use reusable bags. Like that kind of stuff is is the easiest way that I can, on a daily basis, kind of try to minimize my impact. And then, as it relates to travel, as you know, you know, air travel is a significant source of pollution. So. What I try to do there is if I am going to go on a trip, I try to be aware that, you know, I'm taking a big, long airplane ride across a big ocean. And then when I get to my destination, 
I try to offset that as much as possible. I love walking. Walking is easy. You know, you can, you can get a lot of places on your feet. Absolutely. And it's great for heart health and your feet and keeping your body circulating and moving. And plus, my dad was actually a huge proponent of the power of observation by walking or riding a bicycle through town because you're you're manually moving, which is great for the environment. But you also get to see all the little nuance of whether it's a small city or a big city or a little town that you'd never get blazing by at 50 miles an hour in a car. And and I myself have discovered like, hey, whoa, what's this little shop? And then Jolene and I will pop in and discover the greatest, you know, chocolate brownie we've ever eaten in our life or whatever. You know, it's 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 a wonderful thing to walk or ride a bike. There is a benefit that can't be overstated when you are moving at the pace of a human body. Like as you said, you know, you're not flying through something so fast that you don't even register it. You're not enclosed in a bubble inside of a car. Yeah, it's great to be able to connect. You can meet other people. You can, as you said, duck into some little thing that catches your interest. So going from there, I think bicycling or even being on a motorcycle, being out in the elements adds to the experience of travel. Um, Public transportation is a great option, especially if you're in a European country, you know. Absolutely. Public transportation infrastructure is tip top. Trains are great. Subways are great. Buses are great. Trolley cars are great. It also saves a lot of money, too. People don't realize that you can get a a subway or a train pass for, let's say you're going to be somewhere for two weeks. You can just get a rail pass or a subway pass for a couple weeks, far cheaper than renting a car. Taxis, Ubers, car rentals, they're convenient and they cost money. So if you want to throw money and get somewhere fast, great. But yeah, it's not the best way to see a place. Well, I want to bring this back to the environment for a second, because it's great that we're talking about this. When I talk to other people about, about climate change, environmentalists, even a couple of scientists I know, the general consensus they have is that they are they are looking at the world saying, hey, look, what we're hoping for is to minimize the amount of change that's happening because there are no magic bullets for this and the planet likely will not return to the way it used to be but we can if if we take action now we can we can stabilize the earth at least in a new state and go from there so keeping that in mind in your experience and you've done a you've done a substantial amount of environmental work yourself and you're very I I really respect how much you know um what are some things or ideas both in travel and in everyday life that you think are very important for the everyday person to know? It's a difficult thing to maintain an awareness when consumer culture is hitting you on all sides, and I mean all sides daily, with opportunities to spend money on crap we don't need. When I took my first commercial acting class in L.A., the instructor was so great, but she was brutally honest and she said, I'm just going to tell you the truth. We're here to educate you on how to convince people to buy a bunch of shit that they don't really need. That and is... I remember sitting there thinking, that's that's fucking gross, man. Yeah. Yeah, I have a hard time with that. That's a struggle. And, and you know, where my career is right now, I recognize that I am not much of a commercial type. I've got kind of a angular face. I'm really tall and gangly. Like, And thank God, because... I would have the hardest time in the world selling crap. I like, I won't do, (laughs) you know, beggars can't be choosers, but there's a lot of stuff I just won't do because morally it hits me the wrong way. And I'm not going to compromise my ideals for a job that is going to last a day or two. You know, that extends all the way up through movies. You know, at the end of the day, it's a product intended to be sold. And I'm part of that sales process by being involved in it. So personally, I can gain value and benefit in the artistry and the craft of it. Well, but I have to say, I think there's a difference between being a part of a project that is is really its sole purpose is entertainment. You're watching a TV show to you know break away from your life and relax with friends. And TV and movies to me are not the same as you should buy this new thing for your house, you know? Right, right. Commercials are certainly the most overt, direct form of that. Absolutely. Like you are selling a product, no doubt about it. I have the new iPhone and I bought it because specifically for traveling, I wanted the latest camera and the wide angle lens and all that, right? But it was really expensive. And then what's going to happen is next year, even though I have this, you know, $1,200 phone or whatever it was, someone's going to try very hard to convince me that I now need the iPhone 12 or 13 or 14 because yeah. what I have now just, it, it's just dog shit, essentially, you know, where, right. where the reality is that, you know, I could still be on iPhone 6S at this point and it's a great phone. It is. And yeah, you're touching on a huge part of this whole kind of environmental thing that 
it drives me nuts. We are, we're in such a disposable consumer culture. Like I, in my mind, I still want to live in the era where you can take your VCR down to the VCR repair guy and he'll fix it right up for you. And then you can watch videos that won't have screwy tracking for at least another five years. Yeah. I think that if we, if there is any hope in, uh, in the consumer culture kind of pulling out of this nosedive, it's, it's using your power as a consumer to demand better quality products by not buying cheap ass shit just because it's cheap ass shit. Well, and what happened? Like, let's let's look at Apple for a minute. I love their products. I really do. I'm, I'm a yeah. big supporter of Apple. But it used to be you buy a Mac Pro or or an iMac or a laptop, and you could upgrade the components. You could put a new hard drive right. in as, as solid state. Now you buy everything. It's all hardwired. They give you very little choice, and they want you to buy a new machine now every t- few years. And to be, to be honest with you, I think that is fucking bullshit, and it's the one thing that makes me really angry at Apple because it's like, hey, dude, I get that you want to make your $38 billion every quarter, but come on, you know? Uh, yeah. How about 24-hour tech support, and how about making machines that are upgradable so I can have a computer for 10 years like I used to, and I can just put new components in when the components get upgraded? And if oh, that's I the love case, it. yeah, just just become a component manufacturer as well. Start making, you know, start offering Apple hard drives that are that are upgradable, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Just, just from a tech geek side, like I used to love tearing into, I think my first Apple was an Apple LC, and I now I'm up to whatever the latest power book is from 2013, but it's still going along strong because I can get inside of it and, and make it the way I want or upgrade it to my, my own specifications. But to have that, to have that taken away from you is kind of unconscionable. Now, new people who come into this as younger humans aren't going to recognize the difference and they're going to be like, Oh, well, this is what's available. So I'm just going to buy it. They don't know what they're losing. And we are losing something by not being able to, to, as you said, kind of upgrade slash repair yeah, your stuff. All of these companies are taking away our control bit by bit by bit, and they're doing it so slowly that most people are not noticing, and they're actually excited about it. You know, they they don't realize, like you said, how many options they don't have anymore, you know? Right. Well, yes, so that that is a, a tragic aspect of, of consumer culture that I feel I'm going to go ahead and just use the judgment of it should be reversed and and it's only it's only in the hands of the consumers to do this. We are accepting what's being given to us. So if we really want to exert some power for whatever reason, just to have better stuff and or to lessen our impact on the environment by choosing, you know, better quality things, we we just have to make our voices heard because that is what drives the economy. So even though we don't think we have power, we do 100%. You just we have, have all to the power. get behind things that you believe in which involves informing yourself of what you really want. Like, for example, you know, we're talking about travel. And one of my favorite things to take traveling is a good pen of all things, mm-hmm. like a good pen, no matter where you are. You need a good pen, filling out your forms on the plane, taking notes. So to counter this consumer culture thing, uh, the, the innovation of like Kickstarter culture right now is wonderful. People are making amazing stuff in in kind of this rejection of garbage culture. I just picked up a black, sexy titanium pen that accepts Ooh. almost any refill known to man. So now I feel like I can just buy refills when I need them. I don't need to buy a bunch of plastic pens that are garbage. And then this pen goes with me. It's like my pen and it's going to last huh. forever. And I could even pass it along to someone else when I'm done with it. You know, it's not going to go in a landfill. You should send me the link to that pen and I will actually post it on the page for your podcast. Absolutely will. And thank you for not asking me what it's called because I don't know how it's pronounced. It's like Biggie, <laughs> Biggie Design, Bijai Design. I'll send you the link. Yeah, it's a great pen. I also want to say before I forget that if other people listening to the podcast want to look into some more information about environmental stuff, there are things like the London Convention that was designed to stop dumping waste at sea, the Stockholm Convention that regulate, regulates uh, organic pollutants, and the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change through the UN, as well as the Paris Accords. These are all resources that people can dig into and, and look at how to engage in discussions about climate change with their friends without being you know debbie downer and and there's all kinds of great information about all those things and they're all good things to research and yeah you know. it's all out there just just read up a little bit you know it all you have to do is be informed because once you're informed you can you can make some choices Absolutely. If, if you want to you don't even have to make choices you can just tell your friends about what you read and maybe they'll be inspired to make choices but 
we have to make some choices. Like yes. That, that's, that's about all I can say on the environmental issue is we've got to make some new choices. We've been going along on autopilot for years, and now we're seeing the effects of that. So pulling things back around to travel, I want to ask you, where is one of your favorite places you've been in the world? And, and would you recommend it for other people to go? Um, favorite place in the world? I think that Sweden... And or Norway. No, let's go with Norway. Norway is my favorite place that I've been so far. Um, mm. It's probably because my people are from up north. I'm half Latvian, half kind of Euro mutt. So I like the colder northern climates. Half Romulan. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, I spent more time there than I have in a lot of other places as well. I rented a car for the first time and took some days driving. And uh, it's beautiful. It's an absolutely stunning country. And the tunnels there are ridiculous. I went through a tunnel that I think, if I recall correctly, was like 14 kilometers through the earth. There's a roundabout. Wow. There's a highway exchange roundabout inside the earth. It's ridiculous. That's awesome, actually. Yeah, good stuff. And this is in Norway? This is in Norway, between uh, Oslo and Bergen. Is there anything that you don't like about traveling? Uh, being away from my dog. I mm. love my puppy so much. It's, it's hard to leave the pup behind, but, you know, it's always great when they come home. I think... Um, that and and overpacking like if you're gonna go on a trip and have your stuff with you i always am encumbered by the weight no matter what even if i think i'm traveling light once i get somewhere and i'm walking around every ounce counts it's yep. it's a it's a weight that you have to carry literally and it's always better when you have less stuff i've Agreed. never had i've never had such a, a desperate need for something that i was like oh god i wish i had my 12 pound thing on me right now and if, the other thing that people don't realize when they overpack, I mean, we could go for an hour on packing that, you know, gear selection, organization, that's good stuff. But Rolling versus folding. The idea of getting your stuff laid out and then cutting in half, what a scary proposition, but it's always, <laughs> always better. And no matter what it is, wherever you go in the world, when you arrive at an airport, that airport alone is going to have pretty much anything you would need if you forgot something from clothing to toothpaste Toothbrushes, to snacks yeah, exactly. like you're never going to be in that desperate of a situation actually hold on pee keep, so bad keep, me too you want to just keep recording or do you want uh, yeah, keep, you want to keep going and just cut the silence yeah that's fine let's do that because that's right. just one nice take be right back Woo. okay while marty and i are actually off peeing for real i'm going to take this opportunity in post-production to promote next week's episode join me when i interview air force technical sergeant Catherine Rowart, who's not only flown more than 3500 hours but she's a dedicated mom who's going to talk to us about traveling with a child and look we're back from peeing hello hello hey oh. much better um. Much better mood. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly the pace of this podcast is going to take a nosedive. <laughs> We're going to be like, I'm so, so relaxed, anyway. man. How you been? That's hilarious. Um, it's really funny, actually, because I, I obviously love what I do as a traveling blogger and photographer, et cetera, et cetera. And you know what it's like to be a photographer and videographer. But the only thing that when people, when people ask me, like, is there anything you don't like about travel? And like, this is what it is. No matter where I go in the world because of my job... I always have to take a drone and a camera and six batteries and all this camera gear. And no matter how, you know, even mirrorless stuff that's lighter weight and the, the carbon fiber tripods, no matter how much you lighten your load, you're always carrying, you know, 10 to 20 pounds of gear in addition to your clothing and stuff. And I do long to disconnect from the travel stuff at some point and just take a trip where I don't, I don't take any gear with me you know, maybe just my phone and that's it. Well, that's one option. The other option, Daniel, is just take all your camera gear and don't take extra clothing. You know, I was thinking about doing the trip where I'm just in my boxers the whole time, but Norway is so difficult in winter in boxer shorts, you know? I think that could be a segment though. <laughs> <laughs> How long can the hairy Jew survive in the wilds of Scandinavia? <laughs> I'm debating that right now. Like literally as we're recording this, I'm looking over at a case with lighting gear, my backpack that's going to be full of camera gear. And I'm thinking how much, how, how little of an amount of space can I devote to uh, personal gear like underwear and toothbrush stuff? Yeah. And it sucks too, because you think to yourself, you know what? I think I'm only going to bring two camera batteries and I'll just 
charge on the fly. You and then never you charge on the, on the fly. It never works. And then you're on a day where you're shooting something and you're like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. And you end up taking a million photographs and then the red light starts to flash and you're like, shit, I'm totally out of battery power. Yeah. It, so, it's always, the other it's always the wrong choice, which is uh, really illustrative that, you know, there's never a right choice. You can only do what you think is going to be right for the time, plan as well as you can, and then just deal with what happens. So speaking of which, I want to tell a funny story. Uh, for the listeners out there, actually, Marty and I got to work together in Portugal about six years ago, and we were we were shooting the International Gourmet Food Festival, which which was an incredible experience. And and he's an amazing amazing photographer and videographer, and so we got to work together with a couple of their friends, and we're doing this job, and we're we're at this racetrack shooting a go kart uh, event. I love that day. That was so fun. It, it was great for everybody but Daniel because. <laughs> I'm the one filming while these guys are in the go-karts. And I was like, no, no, look, you, you guys, you guys go have fun. This I'll sit this one out. I'll, I'll be the one to record. So I'm, I'm the camera jockey, you know, I'm doing my thing. And one of the go-karts goes by right as I'm changing a lens and poof, just blows a bunch of shit right into my camera. And I, I then had to run around for an hour trying to find a way to clean my sensor because it had grease and all this other stuff on it. And the truth is, I never recovered and the camera didn't get cleaned. I couldn't, I couldn't get it to work. Uh, so thankfully Marty had his camera and I quickly flagged him down and he pulled over and I was like, where's your camera? My, I got grease on my, on my sensor. And uh, so anyway, Marty saved the day and I got to shoot the event with his camera. So was that uh, before or after my GoPro camera fell off the go kart and went rolling oh, across right. the racetrack? <laughs> that's right. We, we actually have that footage captured where the, yeah, it was compelling. Just... My favorite part is when I come walking up to it, pick it up, and look at it and go, oh, shit. Speaking of toys and gear and all the cool stuff, do you have a favorite uh, travel toy or piece of gear you love to take with you? Well, I mentioned the pen. That That's certainly a new love uh, piece of travel gear that I always take with me. Um, I think I'm old enough that my Kindle is now one of my favorite things to take along. It's like, it's just old school enough to not really attract attention, but I can carry however many hundred books and it's, it's light enough to justify its place in my bag. But above anything else, earplugs, man, earplugs. Yeah, definitely. And I got to say, I just found, uh, it's a Swedish made earplug called happy ears. I'm just going to shout them out. Like they're not sponsoring me they can if they want to, but ha <laughs> happy, ears, that, happy ears, they're amazing, Daniel. Um, you need to pick these up. They come in a few different sizes. You can get a, a, a grab bag of their sizes to see what works best for you. And they are a silicone-based earplug that has, it's a, has even attenuation across the frequency range, so it doesn't make things sound muddled. It just drops the overall decibel of everything. Mm. So things are still clear, but quieter. Earplugs are actually super important to me. And I talk about them in my top 50 travel tips that having a great pair of earplugs is essential for travel. And I will definitely look at those happy ears. You said happy ears. Has the majority of your travel in your life been by yourself or with other people? I think it's a fairly even split though. I know that in my heart of hearts, I prefer traveling by myself. Now, why is it? Are you just kind of a nomad? And... I'm a, you know, bit of a misanthrope at heart. No, I, I love people, but I, <laughs> I find that probably because I'm an only child, and probably because I am very definitely an introvert, I, I have a difficult time sharing every decision made from the moment you wake up till the moment you go to bed with other people. And so that part of travel with other people is a little difficult for me sometimes. I mean, it, it can be great if you have someone that you just really jibe with. Um, it can be the best way to travel. Mm -hmm. That's oftentimes difficult if you're traveling with friends or acquaintances. I think that if you travel with other people, and you can probably attest to this, you have to plan for downtime, alone time, and Absolutely. also have some kind of a ripcord, like, I can't deal with this anymore. We need to go our separate ways. Um, that can be a lot easier when you're younger and you're just traveling with friends. If you're traveling with a partner, then that's probably not so reasonable, but you got to be able to get away. This folds beautifully into my statement about when I teach people that planning ahead of time is very important. And part of that planning is if you're going to go travel with six friends to a place, you need to sit down and have an honest conversation and go, okay, if we all start pissing each other off or we're irritating each other, what's our B plan? Where can we go? And also, by the way, I'm just FYI, I'm someone that, you know, needs to have a little alone time. So let's, if we're going to go see the Louvre together in Paris as a group, that's great. But after the museum, I'm going to want to go do my own thing and have dinner by myself, or I want the option to do that. And if you just have an honest conversation with people that you're traveling with, 
chances are everyone's going to feel the same way. I mean, we, we traveled with Jolene's dad and stepmom through Scotland for like eight days and we shared an Airbnb and we had the best time. But at mm-hmm. some point, you know, Jolene would say, Hey guys, I'm going to, I'm just going to go for a run by myself. I want to just breathe some air and okay. Yeah, of course, you know, see you later. And I'd go off and do some stuff on the computer and do some editing and you just, you know, and if y'all care for each other and love each other, then you just, you understand and have that honest conversation. It's not difficult, you know? Yeah. It's a reasonable and mature way to approach travel planning. Is there somewhere you haven't traveled that you really desperately want to get to? Oh, everywhere I haven't traveled to is somewhere I want to go. Um, I think New Agreed, Z- agreed. Yeah, right? New Zealand is probably tops on my list, and, and no thanks to you and your amazing trip that you've documented very well. <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. Yeah, that's a place, again, kind of as the, na- the nature lover in me, it seems like a, definitely a top bucket list destination. The Scandinavian countries have a huge appeal to me. Even Siberia, like that that railway just mm-hmm. sounds kind of mysterious and iconic. And, you know, I, I like that kind of travel as well, probably because I read a lot of Bill Bryson and he has some amazing travel tales. Have you ever had to overcome any kind of particular challenge while traveling? Uh, food choices are probably my biggest challenge while traveling. I've got a, you know, a sensitive stomach and a couple of allergies to, to deal with. So depending on where I am, I have to be pretty rigorous about finding out if the translation is precise, if people really know whether or not there's dairy in a certain thing. Yeah, I'm one of those. I can't do my lot of dairy. But I will say that it's also, you know, travel is a huge opportunity to expand your horizons even uh, gastronomically. And I broke a a 10-year vegetarian stint happily in Barcelona with some jamón iberico. Oh man, it was was well worth it. And what is that? It's a thin-sliced, dry-cured ham that is just amazing. Mm. Do you have a favorite food actually? Pancakes, buddy. Really? How did I not know this all this time? <laughs> well, pancakes with with uh, crunchy peanut butter and maple syrup. I mean, you know, not just any old pancake. Dude, have you ever had the pancake balls in either Southern Ohio or New Orleans? No, but you said pancake and balls, and I don't even understand what you're talking about. It sounds amazing, so though. They take pancake batter and they form it into a ball shape and they inject the center of it with whatever topping is, you know, topping of the day, whether it's apples and spice or maple and peanut butter or whatever. And then they plop them into a deep fryer for a second and then serve them to you with powdered sugar and whatever, you know, Nutella or maple syrup or whatever your thing is. And they are kind of crispy fried on the outside in a very slight thin layer and then soft and squishy pancake on the inside with this little whatever goop is inside them. And I will tell you that they are, they are honestly near orgasmic level, uh, culinary treats. It sounds portable. It sounds delicious. It sounds like all the goop's not going to slide off on your, oh, that solves a lot of problems (laughs) in one piece of food. Way to bring the goop full circle. I love it. It's all about the goop. (laughs) Are there any travel tips that you would like to impart on people from your years of experience. Well, I think we covered most of my favorite things to do while traveling, you know, getting off the beaten path, being public transportation, um, finding a great coffee shop. There's a travel tip. First Mm. thing, find a great coffee shop. Even if you don't drink coffee, get a snack, have some tea, sit down, take stock of things. It's a good way to just kind of take a quick break, not feel like you have to hit the ground running and just not taking too much stuff. Kind of don't overpack. You know, if you have a backpack that you expect to have on you all the time, lay out all your stuff, cut it in half if you can cut it in half. You know, you don't need to take every pair of socks you own. You can wash a pair and wear a pair. I I don't feel that there's a need to pack any differently for a three month trip than I do for a three day trip. Because you can always wash things. And if you can't wash things, you can always pick up something at a local Goodwill or, you know, there's always a way around what you might think is a problem. So you don't have to take the kitchen sink. Exactly. And as far as the laundry thing goes, a lot of people have asked me about this. And what maybe people don't realize is it doesn't matter what budget you're on, because if you're if you're very budget tight and you don't have a lot of money to burn, there are laundromats in almost every town or city that are very inexpensive. It's, you know, five dollars to do some laundry. Right. If you're in a hotel and you have a lot of money to burn, there's laundry service at the hotel and they wash it, press it and deliver it to your room the next day. So it's it's readily available to have your clothes cleaned no matter where you go. Or worst case scenario, wash them in the sink with a little bit of detergent and hang dry them for the next day, you know? I do that all the time. Like, I, I'm i a big proponent of, of wool socks and merino wool, anything, because, you know, we can talk about that later. But 
Oh yeah, you no, can always wash something out, or wring it dry in a in a towel, and it's good to go the next morning. So speaking of merino wool, then I have to say, Marty tried to convince me for years as my friend, saying, "Dude, you got to switch over to wool socks. These cotton ones you're wearing are bullshit, and they're they're not good for what you're doing for traveling." And you're blah blah blah. And I was like, "Whatever, dude. You take your hippie socks and go away." You know? Yeah, you were and, pretty uh, resistant for a while. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> So, but we seriously had a, a conversation about it. So I decided to try a pair of wool socks. I went to REI and I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to buy a nice pair of wool socks and I'm going to give them a free plug, even though I wish they would, you know, pay me to do this. But I ended up with a pair of socks by the company Darn Tough and they're darntough.com out of Vermont. They're a family owned business. They're, as far as I'm concerned, they make some of the greatest socks in the world. And anyway, I switched over to them. And full disclosure, they are a bit pricey. They're about $20 a pair. Uh, for a lot of people, that's like, whoo. However, my darn tough socks have a lifetime warranty, and I've had them now for years and years and years, and I have never had to buy another pair of socks because they're so freaking awesome. And I now have multiple pairs at different thicknesses for different climates. And I will tell you that Marty is a hundred percent correct that Merino wool, uh, wool socks are the shit and you should absolutely invest in them because they're great for hot weather, cold weather. It doesn't matter. They're amazing. And they're so comfortable. And my feet, thank you, sir. Yes, indeed, my friend. Yes. Uh, they, as you said, they regulate temperature. They're great in hot weather because they allow your feet to breathe, but they insulate in cold weather. And when your feet get wet, they don't lose their insulation like synthetics do. But best yes. of all, beating all of that, wool doesn't stink. Yes. I've had some like polypro socks for hiking. They were supposed to be high tech. They smelled like death in the tent. They were horrible. <laughs> but, and, and I've tested this theory myself. You know, you can wear... Hashtag death in the tent. <laughs> <laughs> you can wear wool stuff for days on end and give it a good shake out and it just doesn't stink. So depending, yeah. depending on your bathing habits, they can save you in a pinch. No, for real. When we were in Scotland, I wore the same pair of socks four days in a row and was like, oh, I'll just give them a quick rinse, you know, but, but they were fine. I mean, it's great. It's awesome. Yeah. Can we go to your Wobby question now? Because this is what this is it. Yeah, absolutely. I so I like to ask every interviewer what's what's their Wobby? What's your security blanket item you would take with you when you're traveling, no matter what? Thin weight merino wool long underwear, tops and bottoms. Boom. So you can travel in them. It gives you a nice little extra layer of warmth when you're on the airplane, which is inevitably cold or too hot. It'll regulate your temperature. You can sleep in them like PJs. You can wear them under your clothes. You can just wake up in the morning and throw your clothes on top of them. Don't have to change your long undies. They're great. And it doesn't matter the brand because Merino Wool, has, has they've really figured out how to make it great and not scratchy. And, you know, there's Smart Wool, there's Icebreakers, there's L.L. Bean, whoever you go with. Just find a good size and treat them nice and they'll treat you nice. And it should also be added that uh, one of the reasons I didn't go with wool is because back in the 80s when people were like, you should wear this wool sweater, I'd try one on and it was the itchiest, most horribly <laughs> uncomfortable thing I'd ever had. I was like, it's like strapping on a my sheep body. to you. Yeah. And so now <laughs> what people should know, in case you're wondering, is that th these new wool products are some of the softest things I've ever worn. I put those darn tough socks on my feet and seriously, my feet just go, oh, that's so nice. Your toes have little wool orgasms? Yeah, they have woolgasms, absolutely. Nice. <laughs> Hashtag woolgasms, <laughs> yes. Marty, the last thing we're gonna do here is I, I always like to ask everybody to play my little game, which is 299 philosophical and life questions with Moonbird. As you may already know, I've collected 299 cool questions about life from friends, family, and the internet. You get to pick two numbers, sir, and then I'm gonna ask you those questions. What are your two numbers? Yeah, I will, but I'm, I'm, I have to ask you a question. What happens when you run out of questions? Well, I mean, some people have actually asked the same number, which is fine, but different people give different answers. So the questions are good. Okay, so... And, and can you ever really run out of questions in life? I could probably come up with uh, 2,999 questions. That's true. As long as it's just a framework and you're not like holding strong to like, oh, no, no, Marty, you can't... I'm sorry, 249 is taken. No, no, no. If people, if everyone asks the same number, that's fine. Still, because, you know, different people, different strokes, different folks. All right, I'm ready, buddy. All right, two numbers, go. 250. Okay. And 25. Do you want them in numerical order or no? Which I think the podcaster's choice. We'll just go in the order you you said them. So two fifty. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm really excited. <laughs> this question makes me feel like a therapist. You ready? I'm ready for it. I'm I'm reclined. My feet are up. <clears throat> two fifty. How are you really? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. I feel great. I'm sure you're going to edit it out, but you know I've taken a couple of pee breaks during this podcast. Um, I've had some coffee. Clearly, I've had some coffee. I'm buzzing pretty fast right now. 
But I feel great. Thanks for asking. You're very, very welcome. Uh, what was the other one? 24, 25? 25. 25. Yeah, I'm keeping the theme 25, alive. 25. 25. Oh, wow. Okay. This is very interesting, Marty. How do you feel about sharing your password with your partner? <sighs> Are we starting a new podcast now? Because <laughs> I've got hours of data to relate on this one. I feel that sharing your password with your partner should be a reasonable backup plan tactic. <laughs> but in my personal experience, I cannot recommend it. <laughs> Why are we giggling? Who knows? Uh, we'll just let the listeners wonder. <laughs> Some, I'm just saying sometimes, you know, make sure you vet your partner before you start handing out passwords. <laughs> Not everybody's password worthy. <laughs> I do just have to say that, uh, to put it out there, I think in a healthy long-term commitment with the right person, there is absolutely zero worry about sharing your password. I happily let Jolene know how to access my stuff in case there's an emergency and whatnot. So, uh, but I do think a bit of caution would be in order until you, until you know fully the depth and breadth of that relationship. Maybe, you know, better safe than sorry. Right, Marty? Who knew question five was going to be fraught with so much peril? 25, 25. Who Wait, knew? did you say question five or 25? Because if you said five, I read you the wrong question. No, 25. Do I need to redo? Okay. No, 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 it's fine. How about I read you five anyway, just for fun? What five? What's you... your favorite word? Soup. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. I mean, you know, that's the first thing that popped to mind. Soup. Say it. Soup. It's just kind of a round. No, you know what? Honestly, that's the first one that popped to mind. My longtime favorite word is pudding. Oh, pudding. Because it's even better than soup, but it sounds kind of like, it sounds like pudding. It's smooth, kind of creamy. Pudding. It does. And and who doesn't, when you say the word pudding, who doesn't smile and think of like yummy chocolate pudding or whatever, butterscotch or... Mm. You nailed it, buddy. Butterscotch is my fave. Mm, I love it. I love it. Well, Marty, to bring things full circle, let's uh, tell the listeners out there where they can find you on television. I'm currently on cbs's evil i'm playing a lovely character named george and then not sure when your podcast airs but i might be playing something else kind of <clears throat> devilish you will be airing most likely this will probably be airing uh in the beginning of 2020 at some point then i think you'll have seen it all right um thank you so much for for calling in remotely appreciate you taking the time i know you're a busy man no worries thank you daniel love your face oh love you too buddy and uh we'll see you soon uh in person and uh and on tv i have no follow-up to that all right cool i'm gonna stop recording <laughs> all righty talk soon talk soon travel safe have a great day if you'd like some more moonbird in your life and hey who wouldn't head on over to memories of a moonbird.com or visit me on social media at memories of a moonbird 